Golden Radio Hour. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are that of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. How much longer, Chris? Not long. We'll stop soon as we find a place. Where? Look around. We saw the last shade two days ago. That's a buzzard up there circling the wagons, and it's been following us since dawn. It's waiting for the next one to die. How's the boar? Still burning up with fever. He can't take any more. All right, honey. Hold up! Whoa! Whoa! Uh -huh. Oh! We'll stop here for a few minutes. There. There. Still the fever? Poor little thing is burning up. If I could just use a damp cloth. Try my handkerchief. Can we spare it? If he needs it, we can. Here, put this on your forehead. It'll make you feel better. How's that, son? This is the eleventh day, Christian. Eleven days of fever. He can't go on much longer. Hey, you said that on the third day. And then on the fourth. He'll take more, just as we all will. This is Arizona country. We've got 400 more miles, and we've already traveled almost 2,000. We'll do what we have to do. All of us. How's the boy, Mrs. Horn? About the same. Thank you, Charlie. Figure that Apache country is just due south. That's what you said we were looking out for, ain't it? That's what we've been looking out for. We travel due west, close together, and button up tight at night. No fires if we can help it. Bad Indians down there, Chris. That's what we heard. And they travel in big parties, don't they? And we got five rifles. Five rifles, Chris, and a sick child, and four wagons, and seven dead, tired men and women. We was dead tired a week ago, and a month ago, and a month before that. And there were war parties back in Kansas, and we near froze to death in Colorado. And we was out of our minds with, the, with, with thirst last month. And we've kept on going. We've always kept on going. We always... It's this way, Chris. We've been doing a lot of talking and a lot of thinking. And? We figure we ought to turn back. Turn back? That what you all want? Turn back? Chris, we're about at the end of our rope. We're hungry and we're sick. We figure we better do it now, or we're gonna die out here. You turn back and I guarantee it. You turn back and try to go over 1,500 miles to St. Louis again, and you'll leave your bones bleached in one of those deserts between here and there. Or have your scalps taken off. Or you'll freeze to death in a, in a, in a mountain pass. And if you go on, what's going to happen to that beautiful child of yours? Listen, those 1,500 miles are behind us. They're all gone. The heat, the cold, the misery. You can, you can look back at them as things that have, that have happened. Not agonies you're, you're going to have to live with. How do you know there's not going to be more days and weeks and months like it? How can you be so blame sure? I figure there's only about four to 600 miles more to go. Four to 600 more miles, friends. And then we've made it. We can't stop now. Listen, if we stop, we're dead. That's gospel. We're dead. Could be we're dead anyway. Just, okay, okay, just give me one more week. One week. I'll get us through. I promise you. I'll get us through. What about water? We're almost out of water. I'll get water. I'll, I'll find some. How, Chris? With a divining rod? I, I, I don't know how, but I will. I swear. The year is 1847. The place is the territory of New Mexico. The people are a tiny handful of men and women with a dream. Eleven months ago, they started out from Ohio and headed west. Someone told them about a place called California, about a warm sun and a blue sky. 
about rich land and fresh air. And at this moment, almost a year later, they have seen nothing but cold, heat exhaustion, hunger, and sickness. The men and their families are now one with the animals and the wagons and the landscape, and they stare straight ahead, numb and glassy-eyed. They are dust blobs whose lives have been reduced to a single function, forward motion. The man in the lead wagon is named Christian Horn. He has a dying eight-year-old son and a heart-sick wife, once beautiful but now gaunt and drawn in the merciless desert air. Her husband is the only one who has even a fragment of the dream left, Mr. Chris Horn, who's about to go over the rim of a sand dune in search of water, sustenance, and survival, and who, in just a moment, will find himself heading into an uncharted territory known as the Twilight Zone. And now, back to our story from the Twilight Zone, A Hundred Yards Over the Rim, starring Jim Caviezel, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. A man had best not make promises he can't keep. I give you my word. And food and medicine for your child? We'll have those things. We'll, we'll have food and medicine and, and everything else. If you can just keep going. Just... Just keep going and, and, and don't look back. Look out there instead. L- look west. We don't even know where that is anymore. Don't make any decisions yet. We can't stay here anyway. Once we're past the trail, we'll be able to rest a couple of days. I'm almost out of water, Chris, and food. I'll go up ahead, over that sand hill. I'll do some checking around. Stay here now, all of you. Martha, give me my rifle. Chris? Chris, you might... you might look for a shady spot. A pretty spot where we... where we can... (laughs) I won't talk about bearing our son. Not now. Not while there's life in him. How far you plan on going? Just over the rim there. A hundred yards or so. Might find a stream or something. Maybe some game. A rabbit or two. Never can tell. I guess that's true enough, friend. Never can tell. Stay close to the wagons and keep them bunched up. Hold on, Charlie. All of you. Just hold on. I'll be right back. What in God's name? Hey, everybody. Look what's over here. There's a road. Down on the other side. A, a road. Look. Martha? Charlie? Hey! Hey! Where's the wagons? Where... Where'd everybody go? <laughs> Must have got turned, turned around there. Go on. Go up again and see. Yeah. See which way I'm looking. What's going on? What, what, what in devil's name is going on here? Road, road's hard. And black. What the... What are these poles doing here? All these wires? Joe? Yeah? What was that? Backfire. What? Truck backfired. Oh, you sure? I thought I heard a gun go off. Not likely. Uh, Might be one of those local boys shooting your sign. Well, if it was, I'll get the sheriff out here, but that didn't sound like any 22 to me. Look, Joe, who's that? Some guy with a rifle. Go in the other room. But, Joe... I said, get in back. I'll take care of it. Howdy. Did you see it? You, you, 
you, you, you, did you see that thing? What thing? That monster, that, that big animal, or, or, or monster, whatever it was. It almost hit me. Monster? No, I didn't see anything like that. If there was anything, it never got to hear. It must have. It went by me just a mile or so back. You mean... You, you don't mean the truck. What's a truck? Hey, are you all right? You wouldn't have any water to spare, would you, mister? Any extra, I mean. Water? Sure. Come over here and sit down before you fall down. There you go. Is all this for me? Sure. On the house. Well, thank you kindly. Uh, you want some more? You got more? Sure do. Whoa, whoa, now. You don't want to drink it too fast. Just how long you been out on the desert, anyway? Uh, how long? Uh, well, almost a year. Well, at least almost a year of traveling. Started from Ohio. I had six wagons to start with. One of them was burned by Indians, and one turned back. Indians? Wagons? What are you talking about? Say, mister, what, what happened to your arm? You're bleeding. Oh, yeah, I am. <laughs> well, I guess I did it to myself when that thing come at me. I rolled out of the way. Thought it was a mirage, then the gun went off. Just a flesh wound, though. Not too deep. I'll have Mary Lou look at it. She's my wife. She used to be a nurse's aide. Mary Lou! Everything okay, Joe? The fellow here, he shot himself in the arm. He did? By accident, he says. You want to take a look at it? Oh, why, sure. I'll get some bandages out. Hand me a clean towel, will you, Joe? Sure thing. Got the first aid kit right here under the counter. I'll just set your gun over here. Oh, well, thank you kindly. Well, careful with it now. That's a real old-timer. Antique piece, isn't it? Uh, no. I uh, bought it new before we started out, but she's been used a lot, I guess. We're running low on bullets. I don't suppose you've got any ammunition around here. Oh, uh, no. We don't carry anything like that. This isn't a hunting area. What about Indians? The south of here's Apache country, isn't it? Why, sure. Well, sure, but there aren't any Indians nowadays. Well, I mean, not not hostile Indians. No? Well, not as long as we've been here. Well, how long have you been out here? How long? Oh, well, a couple of years now. Where do you hail from? Well, we used to live in Phoenix. Phoenix? Yeah, Phoenix. Mary Lou's folks are from there. I worked for her old man when we were first married, and then I bought this place here. The restaurant isn't doing so well, but the truckers are starting to come in now with the interstate. Restaurant? Uh, you have food? Sure do. Just like the sign says. <laughs> On the wall there, see it? Right over the register. Joe's Air Flight Cafe and Gas Station. You don't understand a thing I'm talking about, do you? You've never heard of Phoenix or registers or nurses' aides or trucks or gas. Hey, mister... Where are you from, really? Where'd you come from? Tell me straight out, why don't you? From from Ohio. I, I left the wagons back there, and I, I walked up the rim to the hill, and I, I thought I might find some water or something or some game, and then I saw that, that, that uh, you know, that stretch of road out there, that black road, and those, those things, you know, running on it. What things? He means trucks. Hold on. Hold on. You hear that? You hear that? There's another one. It's all right. It won't stop. Take my word for it. Well, we heard tell it was a dangerous route, but the most direct one... To where? California. They say... Uh, they say... I... No, no, take it easy, friend. We can talk about all this later. No, I, I, don't, I don't have much time. I, I promised them I'd be right back. There you go. Your arm's all cleaned up with a bandage on it. I even made you a sling, see? Oh, much obliged. I just try to keep it clean now. I'll give you a roll of gauze and some tape. You're a, a nurse? And you are you the doctor? Me? I just sling hash and pump gas. Take two of these. Drink a little water to get them down. What are they? They're antibiotic tablets. They ought to keep away any infection. Where do you get this? Well, at the drugstore. 
Of course, you're supposed to have a prescription, but these won't do you any harm. How do you feel? Could I? Uh, do you think I, I could buy some more of those pills off you? Oh, I don't sell them. But you see, I, I got a real sick boy back there. Back where? In the wagon, if I can ever find the wagons again. But you say that this will help a, a, a sickness. Sometimes, depending on what it is. How about a, a fever and a bad cough? Uh, it's worth a try. You've got a family? There was three wagons of us, but when I turned around to look back down, they'd, they'd gone. Well, maybe you better rest a while, friend. You, you know, lie down. Get washed up. There's a bed in back. Look at this place. The table's like, like wood, but they're not. They, they can't be. And the legs are all silver and bright. That's not silver. It's steel. It's chrome-plated. What's that thing in the corner? Jukebox. A what? Plays music. You put a coin in it and pick a tune. Here, I'll show you. Hey, where's that coming from? From inside. Didn't you ever see one of these before? You got a... You got a man inside? Playing his guitar on, on, on my account? Let him out of there right now. Turn it off, Joe. There, that's better. It was a bad idea. All these things. Where am I? What is this place? Come with me. I'll show you where to wash up. Wait a minute. That that picture. Where do you where do you get it? The calendar? Pioneer West Insurance Company. That's a picture of my covered wagon. Look, 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 just like my wagon. Oh, well, that's just an old lithograph. The date? That can't be right. It, it says, it says April. But the year's all wrong. This is the year of our Lord, 1847. But this calendar says it's, it's, it's not even the same century. Oh, my dear God, how could that be? Easy now. What's going on here? Who are you people? Where am I? No. 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 No! You better stop him, Joe. He'll get himself killed. Ah! Oh! Come on now, fella. Come inside. Please, please, somebody tell me where I am. One dollar and eighty-four cents your change. You keep it, doll face. I right, thank you. Say, uh, pretty lady, if you don't mind my asking... What time you get off work here? Oh, not till late. But you better not let that man in the kitchen hear you say that. He's my husband. Oh, uh, uh no offense, ma'am. <laughs> None taken. You come back now. I'll do that. Doctor still in back? He is. Been a while now. I made a club sandwich for the fella. You think you want some soup, too? Well, you better ask Doc first. How's he doing back there? You have a fresh pot of coffee? Sure do. Shall I bring it to him? Not for your visitor. For me. I believe I'd like a nice, strong cup. Sit down, Doc. You look like you just seen a ghost. You look him over? I did indeed. And? Malnutrition, that's his major problem, along with dehydration. Well, he's a strong specimen of a man, I'll say that. Tough stock. What else did you find out? You were right. He's an interesting customer, all right? Quite the character. The heat did it, or something, didn't it? I mean, he's, well, he's not in his right mind. I, I figure that has to be it. I'm not a psychiatrist, Joe. I'm an ancient GP. Not much past the school of castor oil and sassafras tea. But, you know, I think old Freud himself would have something to gnaw on here. How do you mean? He happens to seem very rational. 
extremely rational. He can trace his imaginary life a whole lot clearer than some of us can our own. His recall of details is amazing. Or it would be if they were true. Maybe they are true. I mean, maybe he read it in a book somewhere. There's lots of books about the pioneer days. I even know a lot about my people, how they came out here. Now, one other thing. A little parenthetical aside, let's call it. The fillings in his mouth. There are two. Well, let's just say no modern dentist drilled them. Yeah, his clothes, too. They didn't come out of an Army-Navy store. No, they didn't. They're the real goods, circa 19th century. And you saw that squirrel shooter of his, Joe. Sure, but it's an antique. An antique that isn't more than a year old? A hundred and fifty-something-year-old gun, Joe, but it was manufactured less than a year ago. You said that yourself this morning. What's it add up to? Look, Doc, if you're trying to tell me... I'm not trying to tell you anything, Joe. That is to say, I'm not trying to make any point of my own. All I'm giving you is the benefit of some observations from an old hand. He says he's a pioneer, and when he climbed up to the top of that hill out there, he was living in 1847. That's what he said, all right. He seemed so sure. Well, we're three normal, rational human beings here, and we know that sort of thing doesn't happen. So he's suffering from some kind of delusion. But it's a delusion of the purest form. Frankly, I've never heard anything like it. Not with this degree of detail. The way he describes his wife, his son, the wagons, the the other people, it's with genuine emotion. He's lying in there right now with tears rolling down his cheeks, worried about them. He said his boy was sick. He told me his boy was dying. And from the way he described the symptoms, I'd call it pneumonia. That's why he wanted the pills. Which pills? I gave him some antibiotics for the wound in his arm, and he wanted the whole bottle so he could give some to the boy. I don't get it, how someone could be so sincere. I just don't understand it. I don't either. Which leads me to the next question. Yes? What do we do with him, Doc? Precisely what I'm going to deal with right now. Where's your phone? Behind the counter. But wait, who are you calling? The authorities. So they can get him help. Oh, that won't do him any good, will it? They'll lock him up in a rubber room and throw away the key. Once he's turned over to the state, he'll get a thorough examination. They'll know what kind of help he really needs. Yeah, the funny farm. Oh, Doc, I've heard about those places. They're bad news. Nobody even knows you're in there. They they can do anything they want. What are you suggesting? That we pack him a box lunch and send him on his way? You think he'll survive out there? He doesn't know where he is. And even if he figures that out, he'll... Die of heat exposure before the day's over. Uh, I want the sheriff's office, please. Oh, it just doesn't seem right. Yes, uh, is the sheriff there? Oh, in his car. Well, uh, that's even better. Can you radio him to get over to Joe's diner as fast as he can? Uh, We've got a man here who needs looking after. No, 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 not violent, but he should get here real fast anyway. Uh, thanks. Oh, Joe, I hope we're doing the right thing. So do I. Well, at least he's calm now. As calm as any man would be if he suddenly woke up and thought he was past his time. That's enough, Doc. Well, hello, Mr. Horn. This book, it it was in my bedroom. Well, that's the encyclopedia. I was looking through it. I, I found something. What? Well, this this here. Uh, Horn Christian Jr., M.D. Famous for his early work in childhood diseases. Pioneer in vaccine research. Born 1839. Died 1914. Well, that was my son. That, that's Chris Jr. So I guess I'm either crazy or the world is turned upside down... But I think I I got put here for a reason. Oh, you did. I just know it. For an important reason. What are you doing? You've been gracious and kind, and and I appreciate it. But i got to get back. I'll just get my gun now. Horn, we want to help you. But help means rest and medical attention. I can't let you leave like this. Come on, son. Come over here and sit down. I've called for the authorities. The, The authorities? 
Well, listen, I, I don't know who they might be, but I've got no time to wait and find out. Port, please. Hey, don't, don't go trying to stop me now. I know my purpose. I'm going to finish it. Well, my life don't add up to much. Listen to us. Please, Mr. Horn. You take your hands off my gun, mister. You okay, Mary Lou? Oh, I'm fine. The gun just went off when he took it. And blew out my plate glass window. Horn! Horn, come back! Sorry, mister. What's the matter with you? Hort, wait up! Are you all right? Those people, they're trying to stop me. Yeah, huh? Where are you going? I, I have to get back to the Arizona Territory. You do? Well, that's an easy one. Don't just stand there. Get in. beast. How's that? What is this contraption? Peterbilt 18-wheeler. Best long-haul rig ever made. Where's your team? I ain't a teamster. Strictly independent. But your horses? All the horses you want right under the hood. Sweet, huh? Where you say you're headed? California. We were headed for California. Well, that's where I'm going. Good country out there, is it? Easy living, if you ask me. Everything a man could want. And... Land of work? Any seed you plant, it grows tall. That's what I heard tell. Suppose I could give you a ride all the way in, so I'd have somebody to talk to. I'm, I'm, I'm going to California, but I, I, I can't get, get there this way. What are you talking about? Uh, it has to be the same ridge, right, right around here. It was. Mister, you have to let me out. Say, look at that. Sheriff's car, moving like a bat out of hell. Please, I, I made a mistake. You, you've got to stop this, this machine. Hello, Doc. Now, what's this emergency you got? Not exactly an emergency, Sheriff, but since I called, it might have turned into one. <sighs> Sheriff, you got to stop him. That's right. He won't make it out there. Hold on now. What you trying to tell me? <sighs> Mr. Horn, Sheriff. Horn, is it? He's the man I examined. It's a long story, a pretty strange one. The point is, now he's run off. Well, where? He headed for the ridge, where he came from. So... He came in out of the desert? And now he's going back, about a mile up the road. Now, well, don't worry. I'll find him. <laughs> Gotta make it. Just, just a little ways more. You there! Hold it! No, you don't. Not now. Drop the gun, son. I said, drop the gun. All right, now come on down real slow. The pills. I dropped, I dropped the pills. That's it. Now put your hands in the air. Got it! I said halt! Halt, son, or I'll shoot. Sounded like a shot. 
Maybe Chris got himself a rabbit. But he ain't even had time to get up the ridge yet. Martha! Forget something, Christian? Martha, what happened? Where'd you go? Where did we go? What do you mean, Chris? Where could we have gone? Well, when I looked down, I, I, I couldn't see you. Or the wagons. When? You haven't had time to go anywhere. Martha, I, I don't understand what you're saying, but I, I'm, I'm truly glad to see you all this time. All what time? So much happened. First I fell and, well, somehow I shot myself and it doesn't matter. I, I have so much to tell you. But how could oh, you? God, Chris, honey, you just left a second ago. What did you forget? Forget? And what's that in your hand? Oh, that's... that's a medicine. Medicine? Where did you get it? Never mind. Oh, Lord. Give him some water. Give... give him two of these. I think... I think it may save his life, Martha. I see. As you say, then. Chris? Charlie. Short trip. Was it? Nothing much on the other side, I guess. You'd be surprised, Charlie. You'd be mighty surprised. There was a whole lot to be seen at that ram. A whole new land. And you know something else, Charlie? Us. People like us. We're the ones responsible. That's the truth. People like us. What's Orrin talking about? Listen, he's saying something. He wouldn't talk like that unless it was important. There'll be a highway. And machines. And a whole new land. And we're the ones who began it. What are you saying, Chris? Where'd you see all that? Up on the rim. It was all laid out before me like the... Like the New Jerusalem. Wide, hard roads. All black. With no holes in them. And machines and... I gotta see for myself. Me too. Let's go. Up the ridge, he says. Chris, there's nothing down there. It's, it's just like this side. Sand and desert and miles and miles of nothing. Oh, but there will be, Charlie. There will be. Just you wait. It may not happen in our lifetimes, but it's coming. It'll be here, all of it. Sooner than you think. If you can hold on to what I'm telling you and keep the faith. You didn't get him, Sheriff. I saw him all right, but I couldn't get him to stop. Fired a warning shot, but I didn't scare him none. Look, I wouldn't worry, Joe. He can't get very far. Don't worry, we'll find him. Thanks, Sheriff. Y you say he had a gun? That's right, a rifle. This it? It can't be. That one's all rusty, like it's ready to fall apart. That's what I thought. He couldn't have done any damage with it. Look at it close, Joe. It is his rifle, but it's changed. It... It's just as if it had been lying in the desert for a hundred years. What's it mean? Who was he? Where did he really come from? I think... I think he went back to wherever he did come from. But... To where, Joe? Back to where he should be. Back to where he can make certain that the things it said in that book can happen. Back to a wagon train heading west to California on a spring day in 1847. Giddy up, boys. We're going to California. And my son, too. He's got a whole lot to accomplish out there. A whole lot. Mr. Christian Horn, a farmer from the state of Ohio, one of the hearty breed who headed west when there were no blacktop highways or telephone poles or the solace of civilization. 
Mr. Christian Horn and family and their traveling companions, heading west after a brief detour through the Twilight Zone. Hi, this is Carl Amari, producer of the Twilight Zone radio dramas. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about our official website at twilightzoneradio.com, where you'll get the latest news and information on these Twilight Zone radio dramas. Plus, at twilightzoneradio.com, you can digitally download three free episodes or any of our episodes for only $1.95 each. In this age of ever-changing technology, we've decided to make these episodes instantly available to you by making the Twilight Zone radio dramas a digital download only series. This means that this series will no longer be offered on CD. The CD collections at our website are now being offered while supplies last at buy one, get one free. So be sure to get your favorites before they're sold out. Be sure to visit us often and I'll see you in the zone. A Hundred Yards Over the Rim, starring Jim Caviezel, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcherson and based on a script by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Peggy Roeder, Rick Peoples, David Darlow, Doug James, Peter DeFaria, Rich Kamenick, Meg Falcon, Zach Gray, Carl Amari, Roger Wolski, Diane Trice, and Irene Olson. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari and Roger Wolski for Falcon Picture Group. Doug James speaking. You're traveling through another dimension. A dimension not only of sight and sound, but of mind. A journey into a wondrous land whose boundaries are those of imagination. Your next stop, the Twilight Zone. Okay, everybody, listen up. Listen up, all right. I know it's late, and some of you have tests tomorrow. So I won't keep you too much longer, but I'd like to run the beginning of that last scene just one more time. I suck it. I suck Emily? Right, Mr. Galvin? Places for the top of Act 4, Scene 1, please. Hey, Diane. What? Do you want to get some coffee when this is over? Rick, we're not going to get out of here before midnight. And your point would be? Well, wait a second. Phil, you might want to be ready with the drop in case he decides to run the scene change. Okay. From the top of the scene, please. Sound. Ready. Go. Thrice the brinded cat hath mewed. Thrice and once the hedge pig whined. Harpier. So, uh, coffee? No, why not? I won't be sleepy till... Hey, hey! What's the matter? Ow! Ow! Don't grab that barehanded! Here, let me... It won't go anywhere now. Come over here under the light so I can see your hand. No, no, it's okay. But that line shouldn't have taken off like that. It's tied off. We'll check it later. Um, Diane, could you take him to the office? The first aid kit's I uh... don't need a... Uh, 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 uh. You were saying? Okay, uh, maybe, maybe a band-aid. Come on. Uh, uh, It hurts when I touch it. Huh. <sighs> Easier to see out here. Ow. Ooh, ooh, you did get a rope burn there, didn't you? Yeah, I, 
I guess so. Hey, uh, Mr. Galvin's not going to be looking for you, is he? No, he's just running the witch's scene. Lady Macbeth's got nothing until... Oh! Didn't mean to startle you. <sighs> I didn't know you were here, Glenn. Came in at 11, same as always. What'd you do to your hand, Phil? Uh, grabbed a running line. Without your gloves? <laughs> well, everybody does it once. It's the ones who do it twice that you want to watch out for. Right. Then the charm is firm and good. Good. That's it. We'll pick up from there tomorrow. Sounds like you're done. I'm just going to help Phil with his hand before we go. That's a good idea. All right, Toby. Just a few more minutes. Leave the office uh, open when you're finished, will you? It needs a good vacuuming like nobody's business. <laughs> I will. Thanks. Come on, Toby. Hey, how do you suppose he got him to let him bring his dog to work? Well, he's been the janitor here since... Oh, well, since forever. That probably helps. And there's nobody else here most of the time. No need for that. She means well, just doesn't know as much as she thinks she does, that's all. All right, hold still just a second. I'm almost done. All right, uh, I guess we're finished. A six o'clock call for tomorrow, um, and as soon as your hand's wrapped up, you can go home, Phil. Unless you want to grab some coffee with us. Thanks, but I better just go home and get some sleep. Hey, do you want to come in early tomorrow? Ah! Oh, 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 sorry, sorry. Just wanted to make sure it was clean before I put the gauze on. Wait a second. Early? What for? Won't we have to reweight that line? No, no. I, I flew it in a couple of times. It's not off balance at all. It doesn't make any sense. How could it take off like that then? There. Try bending your hand. That, that's good. Thanks. But the line. It's probably the jinx. Jinx? What, what jinx? The jinx on Macbeth. It's... All right, you three, I need to clean up in here. Sorry, we're out of here. I'll tell you the story later, Phil. Good night, Glenn. Good night. It's okay, boy. Like I said, she just doesn't know as much as she thinks she does. Now, let's get to work, hmm? End of rehearsal for a college production of Macbeth. The sets are built, the actors have learned their lines, and the director is finally starting to believe that the show's coming together. The playwright, of course, is absent. But if he were here, he might be tempted to offer a quote from another one of his plays and remind these students that there are more things in heaven and earth than are dreamt of in their philosophies. A good idea to keep in mind especially when the curtain is about to rise in the twilight zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, And Cauldron Bubble, starring Virginia Williams with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Well, hey, Phil. I wasn't sure I'd see you here today. Skip a scene shop class this week? I don't know how bad you have to be hurt to get away with that. <laughs> well, at least they found you a job you can do one-handed. Yep. I can splatter fake stone walls with the best of them. Hey, you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, yourself. We finished with the costumes a little early, and I thought... Hey, Rick, when you two are done, how about giving me a hand with this flat? Uh, sure, Alan. But only because you asked so nicely. Sorry, it's been a lousy day. What happened? I told you about my job, right? Uh, scanning medical records, right? Yeah, it's a great gig, good pay. Work your own hours, take extra time off for shows. So what's the problem? The problem is somebody at the hospital figured out that they could buy some equipment, hire somebody to scan their own stuff, and take in work from other places besides. Man, the 
This piece is heavier than it looks. Hey, uh, Diane, Lindsay, could you come here a sec? Yeah, sure. All right, one, two, three, and up. There we go. Thanks. Anyway, the scanning is going to be done in-house now, so they don't need me anymore. What are you going to do? I don't know. I can't even think about looking for another job until after the show opens. And trying to find something that fits in around this schedule, well, you know what it's like. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to have my job much longer if my car doesn't quit acting up. Twice this week I've been late because it didn't want to start. You can't just throw a few creepy bits into a cauldron and whip up a car repair potion? I wish. <laughs> Only when I'm on stage, but thanks for the suggestion. Hey, hey, Diane, is that is that your jinx again? Ha! <laughs> the one on Macbeth? Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Uh, and don't start thinking about it now either, Lindsay. I swear, actors are the most superstitious people I know. <laughs> oh, and techies aren't superstitious? Go on stage and whistle, Alan. Yeah, I dare you. Hey, there's a reason for that, you know. Right, Rick? Right. The first people to fly scenery in theaters were actually sailors. They already knew how to work with ropes and pulleys, and they didn't have headsets in those days, so they used a different type of whistle to cue every line. And nobody else whistled backstage. Now, wouldn't you feel unlucky if somebody brought a set piece down on your head because you forgot that? Hey, aren't you supposed to be on my side? Always. I can tell you more about it at dinner. Come on, you guys. We got an hour and a half until call time. Who wants to go for Chinese food? Uh, I gotta go home, guys. If I don't have dinner with the parents at least one night a week, I won't need any jinxes to bring me bad luck. Believe me. Chinese sounds good to me. Yeah, me too. Got that last paycheck burning a hole in my pocket. Ah, so you're treating then. Uh, Phil, there's a whole lot of you that hasn't been wrapped in gauze yet, but that could change. Ow. Oh, here. There's still some Kung Pao chicken left. Oh, not for me, thanks. If I eat any more, I'll be able to fly the mane out just by leaning against the line. I think you're going to need a doggy bag, Diane. Make sure you don't call it that around Toby. He'd figure it was for him. <laughs> he's a smart dog, Phil, but I don't think he's that smart. I wouldn't bet against it. Have you ever seen him fetch tools for Glenn? He's the only dog I've ever seen who can tell a screwdriver from a crescent wrench. I've got a better one than that, Alan. Glenn had to come in during the day once, when somebody else was out, sick, and Toby came over to where he was working and scratched at the door, like he wanted to be let out. So? Our old dog did that, and he was so dumb he used to forget his name. So, Glenn tells him, I'm busy, go take a walk. And Toby goes to Glenn's toolbox, picks up a leash, and walks off with it in his mouth. He was still carrying it when he came back. I guess they both figured that if he had a leash, he didn't have to be on a leash. <laughs> <laughs> I still can't figure that guy out. I know he's been working at the school for a long time, but does anybody know what he did before that? Or anything about what he does when he's not at work? I keep forgetting, this is your first semester. You haven't had time to hear all of the stories yet. Some people say Glenn used to be a teacher somewhere, but he got tired of dealing with all the paperwork. Or that he was a roadie and all the partying finally caught up with him. Now that's something I'd love to see. Glenn partying, it boggles the mind. <laughs> but my favorite one is the one where he's writing romance novels under an assumed name and keeping the day job. Uh, the night job for the, uh, benefits. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, speaking of writing, Phil, I never got a chance to tell you about the jinx. Oh, here we go again. Oh, hush, Alan. Read a fortune cookie or something. Here's the thing, Phil. Shakespeare may have been a genius, but he wasn't above borrowing things here and there. He was a plagiarist? Mm, 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 mm. Ordinary writers are plagiarists. Shakespeare was, well... Shakespeare. <laughs> so when he wanted to borrow something, he did. I am shocked. Alan. She won't stop you now. I beg pardon. Oh, do go on. Thank you. Okay. It turns out that when he needed incantations for the witches in Macbeth, he lifted sections out of a 16th century book on Scottish witchcraft. 
all those speeches are really parts of spells. But what does that have to do with being a jinxed show? Magic is a lot like electricity, Phil. It's power. If a spell's done properly from beginning to end, the power is contained, focused. But if you just throw bits and pieces around with no real point to it and no direction, well, it's unpredictable. It's the difference between a light that comes up on cue and one that shorts out and arcs all over the place. See what I mean? Yeah, I, I think so. And the arcs are what brings the bad luck? Exactly. Every time Macbeth is performed, or rehearsed, or even read, uncontrolled power gets set loose. That's why some actors won't even say its name. They call it the Scottish play instead. Tell them what you're supposed to do if you do say it. Oh, you're making fun of me now. I just thought he'd want to hear it. Right. Well, I've never done it myself, but if you say Macbeth, you're supposed to spin in a circle three times, spit and swear. That takes the hoodoo off. <laughs> oh, that would make for a fun performance, wouldn't it? Tragedy, horror, spinning, spitting, swearing. And you wonder why I didn't mention it. Come on, I, you gotta admit, babe, it sounds a little odd. Oh, of course it does. And useless, too. If you actually wanted to do some good, casting a protection spell would make a lot more sense. Um, no offense, but how do you know about this stuff, Diane? Well, my last roommate had a ton of books on magic. She left them when she skipped out on the rent. If you'd like to, I Better can... Better hold that thought. We've got to go soon, Lady Macbeth. Uh-oh. You know what I have to do now, don't you? <laughs> I know that if you do, I am going to take a picture and use it for my screensaver. Especially since you don't believe in any of this anyway. Hey, I'm not saying I couldn't be convinced. I just haven't been. Yet. Well, I hope this isn't the show that changes your mind. Me too. That's a cue, Phil. Let's get the check and head out of here before they realize they've stopped arguing. Rick, have you seen Lindsay? Uh, that's since before we left for dinner. She isn't in the green room? Not in the green room. Not in any of the dressing rooms. Not in the office. Mr. Galvin's going to want to call places as soon as the scenery is set, and we're starting with her entrance. Hold on, j just a second. Has anybody seen Lindsay? Emily's looking for... Yeah, she's not up here. Sorry, nobody's seen her yet. Oh, oh, this is going to be ugly. You know how Mr. Galvin gets when somebody's late. I sure do. I was late once, my first show, with Sir James Galvin, theater director par excellence. I thought he'd get me kicked out of school before he was done. Emily! Here we go. I hope he doesn't decide to shoot the messenger. Phil? Yes? The floor's clear. Go ahead and bring in the drop. Okay. He's not here! Oh boy. I think I'm going to find a set piece to hide under and stay there. Chicken. Rick. Did you know Lindsay's not She's not answering her cell. Try calling her parents. Maybe they know where she is. Oh, yeah. Everybody knows. I hope she's okay. Dan! Uh-oh. Yes, Mr. Galvin? Change of plans. We'll run through Lady Macbeth's speech from 1-5. Alan, bring out one of the chairs and never mind about changing the set. I'm hoping we'll be able to get back on schedule after this. All right, that's fine. All right, Diane, uh, from your entrance, go. They met me in the day of success, and I have learned by the perfectest report they have more in them than mortal knowledge. When I burned in desire to question them further, they made themselves air into which they vanished. Mr. Galvin! Whilst I stood... Stop! Emily, why would you... Emily, what's wrong? I didn't get an answer at Lindsay's parents, so I tried her cell again. Her father answered it this time. They're at the hospital with her in the emergency room. While she was on her way home for dinner, she got into an accident. Her car, her car stalled out in the middle of an intersection and she got broadsided by somebody trying to beat the light. Did they say how badly she was hurt? 
They think she's going to be all right. Her left arm's got a bad break, and her mom says she's one big bruise. But it could have been a lot worse. All right. All right, then. Uh, can I have everyone on stage, please? Quiet, please. Now, most of you probably just heard that Lindsay Morgan was involved in a car accident this afternoon. From what her parents told Emily, she should make a good recovery. However, I know that the show must go on is a cliche, but it's true all the same. Laureen. Yes, sir? You've been understudying Lindsay. Do you know Hecate's lines well enough to work off book? Um, sure. Uh, the rest of you can take a break while Laureen and I go over some of her blocking. Then we'll pick up where we stopped last night at Hecate's entrance. We shouldn't be long. Rick, Alan, hey, can we go to the back office for a minute? Uh, sure. Is there something wrong? I don't... Are we going to the green room? No, 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 not right now. Come with us. What's going on? I'll tell you in a minute. Let's go. Diane? What? I'm still not sure I believe in jinxes, but it seems like something strange is going on here. Oh, good. The monitor's on. We'll be able to tell when they're done. Uh, babe, you want to tell us what this is about? Remember what I said about protection spells? Well, we need to cast one. And soon, before anyone else gets hurt. Settle down, Toby. It's still early. Don't you want your dinner? I know, I know. But there's time yet. Don't worry. I think we should do it tomorrow night if we can, before we get an audience in here. You're starting to weird me out a little, Diane. Phil, she might be right. What? Think about it. Lindsay could have been killed. Maybe somebody will be next time. There are a whole lot of things you don't want to have happen when you've got a stage full of people. Exactly. And that's another thing. If I am right, this is going to get even worse because the witch's scenes are going to be rehearsed so much more now with Laureen taking over Lindsay's part. Are you sure you can do this? Cast a spell and make it work? I... Yes. Yes. If you'll help me. Uh, I don't know how much help I'll be, but I'm not going to let you try this by yourself. Count me in. Me too, then. But I'm still a little weirded out, you know? I know. Okay, I think they're finished. We'd better go. All we have to do is find a way to have the place to ourselves for a little while after the rehearsal tomorrow night. And it'll be okay. I I'm sure of it. Bring up the lights. What's wrong? Sorry, we were moving the castle stairs out, and I think there's something jammed in the casters. Oh, for the love of... Can you see what it is? Uh, it's somebody's sword. Well, it was. I, I mean... Can you move the unit now? Yes, sir. All right, get it into place. Rick. Yes, Mr. Galvin. Bring the drop in. And then I want everyone to stop whatever they're doing and listen for a minute. I'm glad I'm not the one who dropped that sword. Well, I don't know how anybody could have dropped it. What do you mean? People, 
I'm assuming that you're all aware that tomorrow night's our dress rehearsal. That means we have exactly two more chances to get through this show, including tonight, before we do it in front of an audience. Is there anybody here who thinks we're ready? Nobody. Well, that makes it unanimous. Look, I went as easy on everyone last night as I could. We were all distressed by what happened to Lindsay, but we're running out of time here. So I'm telling you, start paying attention and get it together. Because if I have to choose between postponing the opening and letting you embarrass this department with a lousy performance, I know what the choice is going to be. And if it comes to that, you're all going to wish you'd gone to a nice trade school instead. Do I make myself clear? Yes. Yes. Sir. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. yes, sir. Good. We'll pick up where we stopped. Emily? Places for the top of 5-1. Light 78. Stand by. And go. I have two nights watched with you, but can perceive no truth in you. That sword shouldn't have been there. I think everybody would agree with you. No, that's not what I mean. They're only brought out for the fight scenes. Mr. Galvin insisted. Rise from her bed. Throw her nightgown upon her. Unlock her closet. Well, somebody must have been goofing around. It couldn't have gotten there all by itself, right? I don't think I have an answer to that. Well, not one I want to think about right now, anyway. And besides, we have to talk about it later. My entrance is coming up. Just go out there and break a leg, then. But not really, okay? Huh? I'll do my best. <laughs> All right, don't move. Everyone stay right where you are. We should have backup lights in just a moment. There, can you all see? Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Good. Yes, sir. Hi. I'd say what else could go wrong if I weren't so afraid I might find out. So, here's what we're going to do. There's just the rest of the scene left and we're done. We're going to have an early call tomorrow and finish it before we start the dress rehearsal. Be here at five. Whatever the problem with the power is, it should have been taken care of by then. Let us hope. Do we need to let Glenn know before he comes in? I don't think he'll bother coming in when he sees that the power's off, do you? Well, just put any props you have out away. Leave everything else as it is. That'll save us a little time tomorrow. Be careful on your way out, everyone. And do I really need to say, be on time tomorrow? Rick, I'm gonna wait behind the castle drop. Can you catch up with Phil and Alan and bring them back here? I think we finally caught a break, if nobody notices that we've stayed. Well, I don't think we'll get a better chance than this. Okay, but be quiet. Mr. Galvin may come back through to make sure everybody's gone. Hey, guys, have you seen Mr. Galvin? Oh, yeah. He said something about making sure we closed the door behind us and took off. I think he had had it. Oh, so we're the last ones here. Yeah, uh, we hadn't seen you or Diane, so we figured you must still be back here. Okay, let's get started. I want the power going out to be the last shot that Jinx gets at us. Sounds good to me. What do we need to do first? I brought this book. I need more light, and we have to get enough room to stand in a circle. L let's go further downstage. Okay, this is good. In a circle, about an arm's length apart. Just one thing. Will this take very long? I mean, what if somebody comes in to check on the power, then- Don't worry, we should be done and out of here without anyone having a clue. Alan, could you just move a little closer to Phil? There, that's better. Everyone needs to focus, to think about surrounding the theater and everybody in it with a white light that nothing bad can pass through. Just keep that image in your mind while I'm reading, okay? Okay. Here we go, then. 
spirits of air, grant us your protection. Spirits of earth, shield us with your strength. Spirits of water, make all that would harm us flow by. Spirits of fire, wrap us in the safety of your flames. Wait, did you hear that? Shh, not now, if we don't do it the way... Quick, get off the stage, now. <laughs> Diane, look out! Ah! Babe, you've got to get up. Ah! We need to get out of here. I... I... I can't. It's all right, Diane. We'll help you. You can do it. Oh! Diane, something really oh. bad is happening. We can't stay here. My side hurts. I think she's bleeding. Oh! Ow! We'll, we'll, we'll have to carry her then. We'll, we'll, let's just pick her up. Ow, and... Help! 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 Hey, 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 the lights are... <sighs> I'm so sorry! Oh! Yes, Toby, you're right. It is a mess. Glenn? How did you... Later, Rick. But... but right you... now, there's some cleaning up to do. But, Glenn... Have a little patience, Rick. That's half your trouble, all of you. Not an ounce of patience among you. What have you been up to, Diane? Hmm? Glenn, I got hurt. Yes, I can see that. Looks as though a piece of that wall flat caught you on the side when you fell. Glenn, can you help us get her to a hospital? No need for that. Just... There. What do you mean? She's... What was that? Easy, easy. It doesn't hurt now, does it? No, no. No, it doesn't. She must be going into shock. We need... Silence! <gasps> I'm sorry, I just don't have time to argue right now. Come on, Toby. What was that all about? I couldn't talk. Couldn't make a sound. Rick, could you help me up, please? No. Babe, don't try to stand up. But I'm fine. See? A little quiet, please. Thank you. All that is broken, be whole again. <gasps> Look at that. It's all going back together. What, what is this? Magic. No, it's really magic. All that has fallen, rise! It really is. All that has been disturbed, return to your proper place. And all that is unwanted here, be gone! So is my will, so mote it be. Thank you, Toby. That was just the extra push it needed. Nasty stuff, wasn't it? It really is. Uh, Glenn? Oh, yes. You had some questions, didn't you? Well, I have a few to ask you first. It's really not, I mean... Let's go sit down. There's nothing more to do here. And this could take a while. That's all I was trying to do. I just didn't want anybody else to get hurt. But you haven't learned enough yet to protect yourself, much less anyone else. No. Overreaching. Everybody does it once. It's the ones who do it twice that you want to watch out for. I'll remember that. <laughs> no, you won't. 
but that's all right. Uh, Glenn? Who are you? Really, I mean... I'm a janitor, among other things. What other things? Not a romance writer, I'm guessing. Is that the story they're telling now? <laughs> well, I've been accused of worse. Glenn, seriously. Seriously? Oh, why not? It won't matter anyway. I'm a magician. A wizard. A warlock. Whatever you want to call it, Diane, that's, that's what I am. And have been for a very long time. I've learned to adapt to my uh, station in life. <laughs> I'm sorry, but uh, a wizard? It just sounds unbelievable. Does it really? After what you've seen tonight? He has a point, Phil. Okay, but you have these, let's call them powers. We've all seen them. Why would you waste your time working here? I mean, you could do anything. You think so? Sure. Why not? <sighs> because there's no such thing as magic. What? But you... That's what everyone says now, isn't it? Magic? That's something you go to Vegas to see. Or to the movies. Something you read about in children's books. If it's something real you're after, they go to a scientist. An astronomer. A physicist. It's only the scientific marvels that matter now. The age of magic has passed. Hush, Toby. A man's entitled to a good grouse every century or so. Every... every century? Glenn, how old are you? Old enough to have seen Shakespeare's plays when they opened, and to have been written into his last one. You're 400 years old? Nearly five. And you know, I still haven't forgiven that wretched scribbler for what he did to me. Not that it wasn't my fault, too. Vanity. All vanity. I knew who he was, and was dumb enough to be flattered when he sought me out. Someone had told him that if he was going to write about trafficking with spirits, he should talk to me. And fool that I was, I helped him. Then I went to the first night of the Tempest and saw myself on the stage. You're... You're Prospero? Oh, he used another name, I'll give him that. But no one who knew me could have mistaken that character for anyone else. I left the city the moment the curtain went down and never returned. It wasn't easy, but I did it. Made a new life in the colonies. Kept to myself and moved on often enough that no one got suspicious. And I'm not ready to do it again just yet. So we have a little problem, don't we? Uh, no, no problem. He, he's, he's right. We wouldn't tell anyone. You would, though. Sooner or later, you wouldn't be able to help yourselves. You're not going to turn us into toads or anything, are you? <laughs> Magic is the same as any other kind of power. You don't use any more of it than you need to get the results you want. Toads. Well... What are you going to do? Just a little thing. Forget. <coughs> and what are all you doing here? Aren't you done for the night? Uh, we are... but... But what? What well, we had to come back to, um, to... To what? I, I don't remember. Yeah, me either. It couldn't have been too important then, could it? No, I, I guess not. So why don't you clear out and let me get to work here? I'm already behind from having to wait for the power to come back on. I wonder what... Huh. Huh? Oh, well. <laughs> Good night, Glenn. Good night. <laughs> Toby! I think we've done a good night's work already. What do you say we do this the easy way? Just this once. There. Clean as a whistle. Let's go. Exit stage right. A janitor and his faithful dog. Both good actors who know very well how to play the parts the world around them expects and how to slip into very different roles when a casting call comes 
from the Twilight Zone. And Cauldron Bubble, starring Virginia Williams with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was written for The Twilight Zone by Christine Watson. Heard in the cast were Ron Dean, David Darlow, Brian Plaharchuk, Taisha Davis, Patrick Francis, John Huganacher, Joby Cerny, Robert Richards, Rachel Greisinger, Natalie Berg, Katie Rose Sheehan, and Margaret Grace. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced by Carl Amari and directed by Joby Cerny for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design, custom Foley effects, recording, and editing are produced in the Cerny American Sound to Picture Theater by sound designers Craig Lee, Bob Benson, and Tim Cerny. Music for The Twilight Zone is provided by CBS and American Music Company, Incorporated, New York. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to download episodes, including six free episodes on our homepage, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. Thank you for listening. Please like and subscribe.